everyone. Welcome to today's edition of One Single Story. It is September the 2nd, day 240. I'm not sure. <laughs> 240 something. Uh-huh. The only reason I paused is I'm looking on my page here and I have, you see that? I have two day 245s. So, who knows? It's day 240 something. <laughs> It is September the 2nd, I'm sure of that. We're in Ezekiel chapter 22, uh, just six short verses today that we're going to look at. So I, I, I think I'll just read the entirety of it, and then we'll just start talking about it piece by piece. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, the people of Israel are the worthless slag that remains after silver is smelted. They are the dross that is left over, a useless mixture of copper, tin, iron, and lead. So tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Because you are all worthless slag, I will bring you to my crucible in Jerusalem. Just as silver, copper, iron, lead, and tin are melted down in a furnace, I will melt you down in the heat of my fury. I will gather you together and blow the fire of my anger upon you, and you will melt like silver in fierce heat. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury on you. Um, It begins by saying, then this message came to me from the Lord. Just curious because we've talked about this some, you know, how do you determine whether it's from the Lord? Do you believe messages still come from the Lord today through people? The ones that don't contradict God's word. So, I mean, obviously that's got to be a precursor to that. But do you believe messages still come from the Lord today? I think that. I have seen divine revelation. I don't know if necessarily that's a message from the Lord exactly, maybe the way it is here, but I think that people, God has revealed things to people that they wouldn't have known other ways. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that happen before. Okay. Um, For me personally, I think that the Holy Spirit will tell me things or even in reading scripture it's like all of a sudden a light will turn on and i'll think i understand the entirety of this Mm -hmm. correctly for the first time ever even though i'd read it i don't know how many times and i feel like he can be really specific about some things that he wants to see change in my life or in my future i know people who say things like God told me to tell you this, Mm -hmm. or God says, you know, this sickness is going to be healed. And um, I don't know that I've ever personally had a situation where I felt like somebody was telling me something so clearly about someone else that I felt confident in going and telling them that. I may feel the nudge to talk to them about something. But um, I mean, for me personally, I don't know that I've ever felt like God gave me this message that I was to relate to someone else for him that was super specific yeah I put a really high bar if somebody comes to me and says God told me to tell you like Mm -hmm. that bar is really high you gotta leap a really high bar it's different if I feel like the Holy Spirit speaking to me Mm -hmm. about me and something in my life you know I think you have time and you know you should spend time trying to sort through that and uh, um, so he says um, he, he describes them as worthless slag. So he, he talks about after sil- silver smelted, the pieces that come off that are useless. You know, they're they're left over. They're a mixture of a lot of other metals. Um, this seems to be a very drastic comparison, even though it's probably not the most drastic in Ezekiel. They're, they're con- talk to, compared to prostitutes and babies in fields and a whole lot of other things. Um, but the word worthless is the one that is probably somewhat troubling to me um, because we don't think of people in terms of being worthless. 
So what do you believe God's trying to say to them when he's comparing them to worthless slag? That they had been through the refinement process and they had come out lacking. They did not prove to be something that was worth keeping in his eyes at that point. Right. It wasn't useful, I think, is kind of the the word. I don't yeah. Worthless though is a word that is I would never want to say about somebody. Right. Like, it's a very strong word. That's right. why I consider it right. to be troubles, troublesome. Right. And I'm not going to say I've never used it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to say I haven't said somebody's, they're worthless. I'm just going to be straight honest about that. I don't, but I said it, I didn't, don't think I said it, that there was in belief that there was no redemption available to him, you know, but in typically we try to avoid terminology like that, or I think we do. Um, so he talks about them going through this process, through the fire. He, he's going he's gonna to take the, the worthless, what he says is worthless slag, and put them in the melting furnace and melt them down in the heat of his fury. Um, the, there's a couple, I have three or four questions about this just particular process. Do you believe this is a purification process only, or is it judgment, or does judgment bring about purification? I think judgment can bring about purification if we let it. Okay. I mean, that is part of the purpose of us being um, judged of our sins I think and feeling you know guilty when you know you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing because he wants us to eliminate the sin from our life for that reason because it is so harmful to us and you know our relationship with him is supposed to bring about the desire to want to do that yeah we see from the garden even that humans have options and we can choose to do what's right or wrong, do what's helpful or harmful. And so in the refining, we can choose to allow God to work and to become closer to him through it, or we can allow it to add distance and become bitter through it. Yeah, and I I think some of it depends on our response. You know, um, uh, Peter talks about this in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promises. Some people think, no, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So repentance is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire. The elements will melt away in flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. Um, so the, the, the purpose of this process is for separation. There is a significant separation. Any, when you apply heat to metal, you're doing it for a couple of purposes. It, if it's this kind of heat, it's for purification to separate the impurities because it's worth more when it's pure, or, or you're looking to shape it or mold it. You know that it, that it might need some heat to to do that. And um, when I read this, though, the one element that is present that it, that we try, I try to have to sort through is. Um, God's anger that's present here because he, he clearly sees his fury that's part of it. How do you tell so both of you have said 
judgment can be purification, but it's not always meant for that. How do you tell the difference between God's refining me and God's destroying me? You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a big difference in who that's coming from. And God is telling them that they are worthless, but He loves them. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's kind of like a like if a stranger told you you were worthless, you could kind of think, oh, you don't even know me, you yeah. know. But if your parents said that to you, you would take that totally differently. And I feel like that's the case here. You know, he they know that he loves them and he's given them multiple chances and has constantly provided for them and turned them into something great that they were not. But he is now saying like this is what you have chosen to become and I think that is how I take that from God when he's trying to condemn me about something Um, I don't feel I don't think I've ever felt like he was trying to destroy me but I knew that I had been disobedient in the situations where I felt like he was refining me I think at least in our current state of being humans on the earth that the the refiner's fire it's not so much if God wants to destroy us or not it it, it more is our choice mm-hmm. I would say if the fire is truly their choice too right right, right. Mm-hmm. it's their choice I mean they have made choice after choice we have read about horrible choice after horrible choice and treating people wrongly and cheating people and horrible type relationships that have led to all of this so I mean they they are in the middle and I think they are in the middle of the refiner's furnace in the fact of the exile is like happening during this like this is everything they know has been destroyed everything is around them is worthless they don't you know i'm sure that they had some possessions when they were in exile but it was not a position i'd ever want to be in and so and this we also have to realize that this was one message in lots of words that were said and so i think you know i don't think that they would necessarily be like god is calling me worthless right now you know i think it would, they and would that's just this bigger. translation too. You know, the right. other translations don't, don't use the, that word. And right. when you use a modern translation, that's the danger of it. There are going to be some taboo modern words. You know, whereas dross right. is not. And and every translation of the Bible is, by its definition, like a commentary on it. Mm-hmm. It's it it has its own interpretive bent to right. it, and so. Yeah. Except, never mind. Well, I started, no. <laughs> I started to throw a brick and I chose not to. Okay. <laughs> um, so it, it says, and you will melt like silver in fierce heat. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury on you. After it's over, you'll know that the Lord has done something. How can we know God better after refining after judgment how is how will we how should we when we've been through something how should we acknowledge him more see him better I think hopefully the the burning away of dross in our own life takes away some of that rebellion in the that we all have the the desire to do things for our own so hopefully it draws us closer to god it helps us have a clearer picture in a lot of the situations where we feel that we are being refined they're uncomfortable they consume us you know they're not situations that we would typically choose to put ourselves in and when you're in that situation you are constantly turning to God you're asking him for help you know you feel helpless in those situations and I think a lot of those distractions that keep your relationship with him at bay disappear Um, and you know it's 
I hear people talk about it all the time that when they are in these type of situations in their life, they feel closer to God than they do when things are quote unquote good or easy or normal in their lives. I think it's really should be a natural part of the process of all of that happening because it's also one of his purposes in making that happen in your life. Yeah, when you get you should the concept should be when things are removed, you're you're more pure. You can able you can see purity better. So the the follow up with that, and this this passage doesn't even deal with this, but I think both of you would acknowledge. I know I certainly have been through times where I know I was being refined. You know, mm-hmm. I, that the only purpose of what I was going through was to eliminate some things in my life. How can we be more thankful for those moments when they're happening? I think years later, we appreciate it. Time passes, we appreciate it. But in the, in the heat of it, I don't know that we're very thankful. And even should we be? I don't know. What's your answer to that question? I don't know. I, I mean, my... I think one of the things that keeps us from being thankful are the impurities in our life. Mm. And we don't want them out because if we did, we would have already taken them out. Mm-hmm. You know, we would have already dealt with them. You wouldn't have to refine us. To right, that's right. Out. I wouldn't yeah. have to be in the fire to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. I could have gotten rid of it a different way. Um, I, I do think I recognize and am able after time passes thank you for allowing that to happen um but i I was just maybe looking for some insight from you two how do you what is your response typically when you're in the middle of a refining period and do you recognize it when it's going on or do you just blame somebody else (laughs) (laughs) i think i recognize it typically and I think I've responded differently in different situations too. Um, there have been times when I feel like I've just had to buckle in and put my head down and know like this is a long process and I'm going to have to trudge my way through it and trust that I'm going to get where I'm supposed to be on the other side of it. But I can't say that I felt especially thankful at the time that I was going through that. There have been situations where I was going through that and did most definitely feel God's presence a lot stronger and more intensely in my life Mm -hmm. than I typically had on day to day. Yeah, I don't know if feeling thankful is a feeling I would associate with the refiner's fire. I think there, at some points, there can be that acknowledgement of God, this is really hard, but I'm I'm glad we're that I'm working through this or something like that. I think there can be those acknowledgments, but they have to come from a place of like intentionality. It's not going to be like, oh, from the overwhelming abundance mm-hmm. of, right. of your it's not grace, feeling. Lord. I like right, and so you're not going to feel thankful, but you can intentionally try to see the purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think probably the best thing you can do is recognize I need to I'm thankful he loves me enough just to walk with me through this that he cares enough to try to shape me into something that is beneficial it, it is intentional thanksgiving not mm-hmm. emotional thanksgiving well, for sure I think I kind of compare that to a parent who loves their child enough to punish them mm-hmm. because they want to correct it and see them not make the same mistake again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Whereas you're not going to find a child who's like, yay, I'm going to get grounded for the weekend. (laughs) You know, you love me so much. Yeah. But you give them a few years and they might look back and say, yeah, they look uh, back on it. Yeah, yeah, I see why this happened, why they made that decision for me. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, um, Thank you for the refining that you allow us to go through to make us more in your image, to be able to have a stronger relationship with you, to be used more of you. I pray, God, that you would um, help us to make choices and seek repentance sooner 
um, so that those moments are not so protracted and painful, but also as we go through them and come out of them, help us to recognize the work that you're trying to do and what you want to accomplish in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.